Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames went 1-1-1 one, one, and one this past week. Not as well as we all probably hoped. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to break down uh, another marginal week of Flames hockey. Yeah, it, it's weird. The team looks better on the ice than they have probably all season. And yet still went 1-1-1, one, one, and one, which is very frustrating. Especially because, you know, if uh, things went slightly awry in the Rangers game, uh, like the Flames could have been winless this week, even though... That was probably the most complete they've played all year. Well, they started the week off with a game in the nation's capital, ending off their long road trip, and uh, ended up losing to Ottawa in overtime. It was a 4-3 Flames loss. Um, we had go- Flames goals from Dylan Dubé, Tyler Toffoli, Dubé again, were our, or sorry, I guess two scores for the three goals. Like you said, I think this was a pretty good game for the Flames, but... There was just something about them. They they still looked flat. They looked like that road trip was wearing on them. Well, it, it's one of those where like Calgary more or less controlled the play defensively throughout most of the game, and you're right. Like they didn't have like every gear running in the game, but that was still enough to be up three to one with uh, two minutes remaining in the game. And you know, like should have easily coasted to victory, but then uh, Jacob Markstrom and his issues happened and the flames lost 4-3 in overtime so uh one of those where like the game was entirely lost on jacob markstrom like there it simply is nobody else to blame on this one and how many times have we said that this year man uh, yeah exactly and this one like it, with both of the goals that were scored late um markstrom all season one of the main struggles he's had is he's way too deep in his net and like that uh, first shot uh, on the three-two goal, um, he flubbed it a bit because the shot uh, placement uh, and it rolled down his leg for a tap in uh, to the Ottawa player. If he had been say a foot or two further out, like say at the top of his crease instead of like almost close to the goal line. That puck would have just hit his pad or his glove, and it would have just been an easy routine save, reset for a face-off, no big deal. Similarly, on the next goal, because he was too in his net, if he, he basically, when he went to transition over to stop the shot coming from the narrow angle, he his arm kind of got caught in the net, and he couldn't just hug the post. If he was up further, he could have slid further over to block the shot, and it would have just hit his shoulder, and it would have been another fairly, like, a good save, but a routine save. And, like, both of those goals were routine saves that he just did not play well because he was way too far in his net, and that's been a consistent thing I've noticed throughout this season is that when he starts giving up bad goals... It's because he's too deep, and that, that's a failure on the goalie coaches because they're, you know, just because Markstrom's big doesn't mean that he should be playing that close to his net because you're cutting off the height advantage and, you know, you're allow, allowing, frankly, very stoppable shots from going in. This is Markstrom's 14th year in the NHL, and it's really not looking like a 14 year. NHLer. No, this is pretty much looking as bad as Jonas Hiller was when he couldn't see the puck from being shot from the blue line due to vertigo. Like, and I'd say his his sixth year as a starter. Yeah, and it's one of those where, you know, it, you know, he did rebound in the New York Rangers game later in the week, and that's good. And if he can build on the Rangers game, that's fine. Because he actually looked more like the Mark Stern from last year. But he's looked good before, and nothing's led us to believe that he's going to rebound. No, and that's one of those where, like, if like these struggles do not stop between now and the offseason, like, the Flames do have to find a way to move him, even if it's a James Neal for Milan Lucic type deal where we're taking another team's bad contract just to get out, you know, because he needs a change like if this is going to be how it is like he'll need a change of scenery just as bad as we need a change of goalie at that point Well, let's come back to that once we're done uh, recapping this week 
The the next game for the Flames was in Calgary after the road trip against the Detroit Red Wings. This is a game that I think we all had probably penciled in as a win for the Flames. And quite a surprising 5-2 to two loss for the Calgary Flames. Dominic Kubalik netted two goals, and Tyler Bertuzzi and Dylan Larkin each got three points as they, I would say, ran over the Flames. Um, Dan Vladar net in this one, so giving Jacob Marks from the night off, but this was this was a rough game for the Flames. And uh, we've seen lately that this team has a really hard time closing out and opening periods. And, like, the Flames dominated the first period and absolutely controlled everything. It, like, it should have been 2 or 3 nothing heading into the first intermission. Instead, they got a little casual right at the end of the period and allowed the tying goal. And then, like, right off the hop, they allowed another bad goal um in the second period they fought back to tie it then the defense just stopped playing hockey entirely and let vladar out to hang out to dry and the game was over pretty much from the point when the red wings took the lead again and like the flames just stopped playing at that point yeah i think that's a fair fair uh, recap of that one and then, of course, the Calgary Flames played on Hockey Night in Canada Saturday night in the Cell Dome, and the New York Rangers came to town. We weren't quite sure what to expect after the previous Rangers game, um, but Backlund and the Flames ended the Rangers' seven-game winning streak in this one. Big night for uh, number 10, Jonathan Huberto, as well, after the tweet from his agent, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the Calgary Flames end up with a 3-2 overtime win in this one. Yeah, this was one of those games where like the score really, 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 really flatters the New York Rangers. That If Yaroslav Halak was not standing on his head, this is probably an 8-2 game for uh, the Flames. And full credit to Halak for earning the Rangers a point, because he is literally the only reason why uh, the Rangers got it to overtime. It was just simple magic by him. And, like, there was so many plays where the Flames had a great A scoring chance and he just robbed them. And, you know, it, kudos to them. And uh, the Flames also set an NHL record, becoming the first team to score two goals in the first minute twice in a single season. Uh, no team had ever done that before, so... Fairly odd little neat stat to have. You know, this team is a weird team because, you know, we go through a week with the Ottawa game, the Detroit game. We've seen this before. It's not just this week. And then you get a game like this where you go, wow, that's what the Calgary Flames are. And when I looked at um, at uh, number 10 in this one, even though he didn't necessarily score the the uh, overtime goal, he got the assist on it as well as the Kadri goal. Um, you know, you go, wow, he's looking like a game breaker. He's looking like... Um, you know, the guy that we brought him in to be. This whole team was clicking. But then you know as well as I do, the next game they're going to look like crap again. Well, uh, that's the difficult part. Like, that that game from Huberto is basically how he was every game with Florida. Like, he was... Yeah. Because, you know, being a Florida Panthers fan, like, you get used to how players play. And, like, that's just, like, a average, normal game for Huberto. And it's like, that's part of the reason why it's been so frustrating to see him this season, because it's like, well, where did that guy go? Because you don't magically forget how to hockey <laughs> that quickly just because you got traded to a new team. And, you know, it's good to see that, you know, that person's still in there. And perhaps, you know, that tweet and the whole controversy surrounding it was enough to light a fire under him to play like he normally does and you know if that's what we see from huberto the rest of the way you know then that would be great but you know as you've said like yeah we had a really awesome game and you know it being a matinee game against the flyers tomorrow um flyers are terrible and yeah i could easily see the flames falling flat on their face again and it, it, you don't know with this team until you actually like are pretty much through the re the whole game, because even the Ottawa game it looked like a gimme, and then you know Markstrom found a way to take a point away, and it, it you know it, it's just frustrating because like when the team is running on full cylinders, that's what you get, and like this team is elite defensively, elite offensively. And, you know, is a real feisty pain in the rear end to play against. But you 
seen that maybe four times this year. And it's like... <laughs> four times in 56 games. Yeah, and it's like, um, can the real Calgary Flame show up? Or, you know, like, if that's what you actually are, can, you know, um, we're getting to the end of the season here. Uh, <laughs> and I think, you know, and I don't think we have answers today, but I think at the end of the season, the question's going to have to be asked, why couldn't they show up more often? Yeah, and, you know, it's one of those where it's both good and bad that the Flames really don't have any free agents at the end of the year, other than Lucic, uh, because... Uh, you're able to like if the it's not the players it's easy to fix because you just add uh whatever you think you're like a depth defenseman that kind of thing uh maybe trade the goaltender if that continues to be a problem you know like those kind of solutions whereas if it's like oh well players x y and z are being a problem well then you have to move them and 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 you know what says your team in at that point and you know like that's a lot more bs to <laughs> deal with so you know at least with the last 25 games or so like they'll have an opportunity to ferret that all out well with that the calgary flames now played 56 games they have 26 wins 19 losses and 11 overtime losses for a total of 63 points um, which puts them out of the wild card. They are two points back in Minnesota, who's in the final Western Conference wild card at 65 points. Edmonton just above them at uh, 68 points. And then Seattle in the last place in the Pacific with uh, 70 points. So the Flames, you know, as bad as things sound, are not too far out of this. No, and this is one of those where, like, this week has really hurt the Flames, where, like, they needed to in order to keep pace with everybody, they needed to win those games against Detroit and Ottawa. And instead they've fallen three points further back, which, you know, now it's looking more like an uphill battle just to get into a playoff spot instead of, you know, possibly taking the division. And, you know, like the flames are going to have to imminently go on like an eight or 10 game winning streak in order to, you know, be on, be beyond a wild card spot. And, you know, it, time's running out, and, like, this team, like, based on the next four games between now and the trade deadline, you know, like, if they drop three or four of them, you know, you're starting to look at a team that might need to think about next season. And, you know, I think this whole win-loss, overtime-loss thing is a little bit of a, I think, a, a distraction. If you look at the numbers, the Flames have won 26 and lost 30. I mean, yes, they picked up a point in some of those, but they've lost more than they've won this year. Yeah. And realistically, like, you know, the three on three, if they were better at it, you know, and say they, you split the difference and give them five wins instead of more, instead of like 11 losses, uh, you know, then like they're right up with Edmonton and like four points out of first. And, you know, you're in that conversation and it's been primarily a lack of execution and overtime that's really hurt this team and uh that's due to guys like huberdo not showing up like huberdo was one of the best players in overtime in previous seasons and yet he's been directly responsible for four of the losses thus far and it's i guess the, the good news stats wise and i don't i don't want to cut you off there but we'll come back yeah. to huberdo and maybe where he's at when we talk about alan walsh um, if we look at money puck they have their odds for each team making the playoffs and even though calgary is below minnesota right now calgary has playoff odds of 83.5 percent where minnesota's only got 66.4 percent so um if they if the next game is one in regulation that jumps up to 94.43 percent so quite a bit of, or sorry that jumps up to 85.4 percent from 83.5 percent so calgary is uh is you know poised and you've said it before better schedule Calgary should go should be able to pull this one out. Yeah, and realistically, with the quality of competition, like the Flames are playing, like out of the twenty six games remaining, about uh, eighteen of them are against poor to like marginal playoff teams or worse, where you know you should be beating most of those teams. And if Calgary can play like they did against the Rangers, they will naturally just kind of win most of those games but it's 
whatever their problem is seems to be between their ears and like when they're actually focused and applied you're seeing performances like against the rangers it's just you know needing to get going and like this team is running out of time and you know it's like if the flames had lost to the rangers yesterday like i would have been fully on replace the coach and see the rest of the way because you know like the you you have to because <laughs> like we have everybody under contract for next year it's not like you can just walk away from free agents and you know re retool that way um like everybody's gonna be here again next year so you know it, but you know the flames did pull out the win and it's frustrating because when you see them play like that you're and you know, if they get any consistency like that, they can go on and do good things. But what iteration of the team you're getting at any given point, who knows? Well, let's go back to that idea of Jacob Markstrom when you're talking about iterations of this team. And, I mean, you're talking about moving them in the offseason for a bad deal uh, from another team potentially that they have to. I don't even know if I'd go that far yet, Matt. I think if you look at Dan Vladar or even Dustin Wolf as your next goalie i think they're going to need a veteran i think you might be better to eat the markstrom deal for one more year and just play him backup minutes yeah and that alternatively could be an option but um i mean i think you got to go into next year assuming he's going to be your starter that he's going to bounce back from this but give him a very short leash and then quickly swap him if you need yeah to. it's tough because you know, like, I don't have confidence in Dan Vladar being a starter. Um, like, he ha hasn't shown... Like, he's shown flashes of being good, but it's... The consistency isn't there, and... Um, you know, it, it's tough. Um, like, it, you know, you're... And while I don't disagree, I remind people, too, Dan Vladar has played a total of 49 NHL games, so I think he's still very much a goalie that we're learning what he is. True. It... it and I bet if we looked at, I bet if we went back and looked at Markstrom forty nine games in, we wouldn't have said this guy's going to be a bona fide starter. No, and it it's just the whole situation's tough because like when Markstrom's on, he is the goalie that we saw last year, who was one of the best goalies in the NHL. It it's just you know seeing how he's been playing, you know, like he's been too deep in his net for most of the season, and. You know, he gets shocked, shell shocked a bit when he gives up a goal and then, you know, it messes with him. Like, even though, you know, like you say in the Buffalo game the week before, where Tag Thompson wired a shot that was just a perfectly placed, well executed shot, nothing that him or any other goalie could have done with that. And, you know, it just happened to be in the first 10 minutes of the game, which stereotypically he's been giving up goals like that throws him for a loop, he's playing too deep in his net again, misses his marks from where he needed to be positionally and gives up another terrible goal. And it's, like, he needs to reset himself and be more assertive and not be so deep in his net and go and challenge people. And, like, he he's playing too tentatively. And, like, you know, if you're playing not to give up a goal, you're going to end up giving up a goal. And he's playing the goalie version of that instead of the team version of that. And it, it's just tough to see because like when he's good, you know, he's great. It, it's just, you know, it, it's tough. Yeah. And he's also, um, Marsham, it looks like has a full no move clause. So even if we wanted to move him, it might not be as easy as we think it would be. True. It, it's just, um, you know, one of those situations where if things got to that extent where, like, say this is how bad he was the rest of the way, I think both he and the team would both be kind of like, yeah, let's find you a different situation because whatever isn't working here and, you know, um, that way you can reset and hopefully it not be, you know, like the end of your career because, like, if... I'm saying that the kind of team that would want him and would be giving us the bad contract might not be where he would ultimately want to go. Oh, for sure. And yeah, it, it the whole situation's just tough. And 
it, it, you know, that'll be a question for the off season shows, uh, especially like if the Flames miss the playoffs. But it's really frustrating because of the fact that like we both know how good he is when he's playing confidently. And, you know, like, he was the goalie that went save for save with Jake Ottinger last year, who had a historically good playoff round, and, you know, he went save for save with them, and, you know, the Flames made it to the second round because of how good Markstrom played, just as much as, you know, the Stars pushed it to seven in overtime on Ottinger's back. You know, like the Flames, if Markstrom was just playing okay or decent, like the Flames probably lose that series in six. But, you know, it, it's just... Confidence seems to be just the, the problem, frankly, for him. And, you know, if he can get a good 20 games out of the last stretch of the season and, like, 18, 20 games where he's playing more like himself and confident, then you know, everything's fine heading into the playoffs and, like, there isn't a problem. And because basically the Flames' entire problem this season has been the goaltending. And I can't remember the last time we saw a goaltender who went from, um, you know, I would say, like you said, one of the top goalies in the league to being as terrible as, as he is um, in one season. Like, it makes me wonder what has gone on there and if it is recoverable or repairable yeah and that's where uh like change of scenery might be necessary if things don't reset themselves it's just and and on a t and on a, i guess a related topic how much of that do we have to put on the goaltending coaching team here i mean we've got siglet we've got um you know we've got la barbara like how much of this do you put on marks from shoulders versus having to maybe look at the team that's working with the goalies well and that's where to be fair to Jordan Siglet, like he's more the talent evaluator guy now, um, and like guys that found guys like Chechelev, Wolf, uh, Sergeyev, or Sergeyev, pardon me, um, that uh, you know they're, you know, that's more of his game is dealing with that. Where La Barbara's the you know day to day uh, goalie coach, where you know, and if the Flames miss the playoffs, say, this season, then you have to look at firing the goalie coach at a minimum, uh, if not, like, a more wholesale management uh, coaching staff switch up because, you know, like, frankly, with how poorly uh, Markstrom's played, like, it, this is, like, uh, one of the worst seasons for a goaltender in the last 25 years. Like, it's not just he's bad for an NHL team. This is, like, historically bad. And, you know, as hard as it is to say, like, if the Flames had even just a marginal, like, average goaltending, like, the Flames are in first in the West right now. And, it, like, it, there have been at least 15 to 20 points shed because of Marks from playing bad. And it's hard uh, when, you know, like, you're dealing with a team that on paper and in most aspects should be doing a lot better, but you know, it's being hamstrung by the goaltending. And if he can the, bounce the back and like how he played against the New York Rangers, if he plays like that the rest of the way, there's no problem. You know, we shut up, we make the playoffs. There's no problem, <laughs> you know? And cause if he plays even like 85, 90% of what we saw in the Rangers game, with the quality of opponents, like the Flames are probably going to win the first, uh, not the first in the division, but the first, uh, the other home ice spot in the Pacific and be like right there. And, you know, it, it'll just be interesting to see. But even then, I'm, I mean, with how fragile he's shown that he is all year, I'm not even convinced at that point that even if Marsham finds a way to bounce back, that that, I guess whatever he changes mentally continues. Like, I think he's still going to be very fragile in the playoffs and that could be the end of the flames. Well, no. And that's where like, it'll be incumbent on Daryl um, specifically to realize, like say how he played in the Edmonton series that like after game two, it should have been Vladar's net in the Edmonton series last year. Um, but 
you know, I think that, you know, riding a single goaltender throughout the playoffs is kind of going a little by the wayside, and you need to have two guys that can actually play adequately in the postseason. And Vladar, um, thus far this season, has shown that he can play competently. You know, he's not as good as what he would need to be to be a starter heading into the postseason, but... You know, and that's also where, you know, you also have Dustin Wolf available. And yes, you know, we mentioned last week about not wanting to ruin the Wranglers season with bringing him up. But it's also another viable situation. Like, if you look back a handful of years, uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins recalled Matt Murray, who's the exact same age at the time that Wolf is now. It's an option, yeah. but we have no we have no evidence to say that that's going to be the solve. No, I, I, I know, and it's one of those where like if that becomes you know more of a well, hey, throw it to the kid and see because A and B are not doing their job, you know, and like the Flames because of their quality, of their competition, they could make the playoffs even if they're just okay, and. It, it will be interesting to see, and it might be one of those situations where if, like, Mark's from still waffling and Vladar is not playing up to snuff, that you could throw Wolf in and say, well, kid, have fun. Uh, you know, because the same thing did happen with the Penguins that year where Marc-Andre Fleury struggled and they threw Murray in because, well, hey, he's playing well, too. And, you know, Murray ended up taking the job and running with it, and they ended up winning the Stanley Cup. Not to say that Calgary would follow suit, but it's one of those where, you know, at a certain point you have to do something, and, you know, the Penguins made a bold move there, and it ended up working out well for them. And, you know, if the goaltending is continuing to be the problem uh, heading towards the postseason, maybe you just pull the trigger, throw Wolf in, and... Say, well, you know, no time like the present. And, <laughs> you know, and. And when you were talking earlier about what they did with, you know, what they might do with Markstrom next year, I think a lot of that also depends on do they expect to be competitive? And if they're competitive, then yeah, maybe you move Markstrom to bring somebody else in. If they're not expecting to be competitive, maybe the best thing to do is just to ride out that salary and keep the veteran goalie on your roster. Yeah, well, and that's true as well. Like, if the Flames decide that, you know, it's time to do a more significant retool and, you know, move the guys like Lindholm to Foley, Backlund, et cetera, et cetera, and get younger uh, through that than, you know, riding out Markstrom's contract. Like, you're not going to buy that deal out because, like, at that point, there's no reason to rob your cap five, six years down the road, um, eat the deal for a year or two, and see how it goes. I agree. And, you know, it, it's just frustrating because of the fact that, you know, it, it's just like seeing Jonathan Huberdeau. You know that guy is good. And you know Markstrom is good. He has a track record of being good. And for whatever reason, and I think in both their case, it's all in their ears, uh, that, you know, they're just not being able to find that right mojo in themselves to push themselves forward. And, you know, we'll see, um, you know, the, the Rangers game, like after the whole Walsh incident, those two guys specifically had a fire lit under their ass and they both played their best game of the season. If that's a one off. Okay. But that, something tells me I, think that in both their cases that it might be enough to shock them into getting themselves going well let's talk about the walsh instance so for those that don't know alan walsh is a I, I i don't know if we should use the word notorious but well-known nhl agent and notorious for um posting on twitter about i'd say controversial things when he about his clients over the years and uh, he did it again this time. The tweet read, and we'll also have it embedded in the show notes for this episode if you want to read it in its entirety. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Also, negativity sucks the joy right out of players. CC at NHL Flames was what Alan Walsh posted after the Detroit game. 
So he, uh, for those that don't know, Alan Walsh is the agent for Jonathan Huberto. And um, Huberto had come out after that and said he didn't know that this tweet was coming. And while I understand that, I also don't know if I 100% go with that. Alan Walsh has said in the past when he's made tweets like this that uh, his his clients have always known the tweet was coming. It was I think it's been sort of said in the hockey community that's often their thoughts, but he's putting his name on it to get his message out there. I'll give you my thoughts on this first, yeah. Matt. Um, I, I could see maybe a tweet like this if your client was taking this team on, the, on his back all by himself and, you know... He was the only guy doing anything. Jonathan Huberto is a 38 points. He's fourth on the team. Last year, he had a 115-point season. Like, he's having a disappointing season. So I think it's tough for you to come call out the team and call out the culture here when your guy's struggling just as much as everybody else. Well, and that's the thing. Like, if uh, you believe Huberto at face value and that he didn't necessarily know that that was what was coming, um, you know... It is a bit of an egg on his face as well because he legitimately has been terrible for Jonathan Huberto this season. And let's say even if he didn't know it was coming, I wouldn't be surprised if he'd maybe expressed frustration to his agent. Oh, yeah, and I'm sure. And, you know, like, none of this season has gone right for the Flames. Like, you know, we're 56 games in, and, you know, like, I don't think anybody expected the Flames to be at 63 points. 73, 83, sure, but not 63. And, um, you know, and I think that the internal frustrations, like, you know, like, it's understandable why Daryl would be really ticked off with the team, you know, and it's understandable why the players might be frustrated because thing, they're not, nothing has been clicking for them. And, like, they've been cursed with hitting the post like three or four times practically every game and you know like even when you're doing all the things that you need to do to score goals then you ring it off the post or you run into Yaroslav Halak robbing you left right and center on glorious scoring chances and it's like really <laughs> you know um but sometimes players need to play angry in order to play well um like I know like when I played hockey or soccer or whatever like if i could find a way to get annoyed like the my performance in those games went significantly higher and i'm sure that you know nhl players you know a lot of them need to find whatever trick to motivate themselves and like this whole situation like this whole season frankly has been a bit embarrassing for the caliber of team that the flames are that you know they're being as bad as they have been and like there's really no excuses left uh, for the players or the coaching staff or the management and you know like it, it is coming to a head because the trade deadline's a week away and you know like this team was kind of look you know like realistically looking at going out and getting like your Patrick Kane or whatever whatever and you know it being a realistic that makes sense because this team's good and instead, you know, with where they're at, it's like, do we actually flip the switch and sell instead? And, you know, if this team can find something to rally around, even if it's just the frustrations and getting them out and working them out on the ice and, you know, channeling that anger and frustration, like Huberto looked very intense in that game yesterday and you know, like very determined and like he was shooting the puck with authority when he, he's primarily known as the pass first guy. And he, you know, he was not really looking pass first, even though he did get a couple of assists in the game. You know, it, it was like, I don't care. I'm putting it in and taking the bull by the horns on that. And, you know, you, you, you need him to play like that. And he, if he can channel that, then, you know, this team is going to be having a fun month and a half. But I, I want to, I just want to go back to what I said earlier that Huberto maybe knew this was coming. I don't want to say that Huberto maybe said to him, hey, can you tweet this for me? But I bet Huberto was maybe expressing frustration, Alan Walsh. Alan Walsh, I think, probably would have run by Huberto. Would you be okay if I tweeted that or something like that? Because you don't want these guys to drop you out of frustration. At the same time, agents want to get the most out. I mean, 
technically agents want to get the most other players at the same time, but maybe not. I mean, he just got his money. It's probably the last deal he'll sign with Huberdeau. But I'm wondering if sort of like Daryl has to motivate players differently. You wonder if sort of like you're saying, maybe Alan Walsh knew this is the motivator that uh, Huberto needed. Well, how would you say? You also don't need your client being in a situation like, say, Huberto sucked the rest of the year and then is entering a $10 million contract. Now all the pressure is on Huberto to be awesome right from the get-go next year. And then what happens if... You know, he's bad. And then, like, you know, the team's going to be looking at offloading him. And, you know, being in Calgary is a very good situation for Huberto. You know, there are teams out there that, it you know, that are terrible, legitimately, like the Anaheims and Arizonas of the league, where they could eat a contract like Huberto's. And, you know, if the Flames just wanted to get rid of the contract, they could. Yeah, I don't think you move it after one day. No, year, I know. The, I'm talking like a year or two from now type of thing. Uh, just to get rid of it. And, you know, like being in Anaheim or Arizona is not a good situation for Huberto as, you know, his client. So if, you know, Walsh is doing what he did to kind of light a fire under him and it works, then, hey, there's no problem. And again, like, if Huberto plays, like, the last 25 games like the Huberto that I've been familiar with with him in Florida for the last decade, then, you know, the the worries about, you know, like him having 38 points at this point, nobody's going to care because, yeah, okay, it took you a while to get going, but you did, cool, and see you next year, let's have some fun. And, like, the pressure's off Huberdo, where if this problem continues, then the, all the pressure's on Huberdo. And, like, it, it, you know, Walsh is doing a very good job at protecting his client's interests, even though, like, his contract doesn't matter. Like, it's done. He's getting $84 million. You know, that part of it is done. Walsh probably gets 10% of that. That's already been established. Yeah. And probably the last contract Walsh will negotiate for. Yeah, him. so it's more making sure that your client is in the best position that he can be in. And, you know, when Huberto is his, one of his premier clients and, you know, it matters that he's doing well. And while the deal is signed, there's still other deals you can get. You can get sponsorship and you can get other things. And if you're not doing well, that's money you're leaving on the table. Exactly. And, you know, how would you say, you don't want to have your client being compared to Gary Lehman. And, you know, I've started to hear people starting to put Huberto in that conversation. For those that don't know, tell them the Gary Lehman comparison. Uh, when the Flames traded Doug Gilmore to Toronto, uh, they were expecting Gary Lehman, who was the principal guy in return, to be basically an equivalent player to Doug Gilmore because he had been a 50-goal guy that, in the recent past. And... You know, everything looked like that was a fair deal. And then Lehman came here and was absolutely abhorrently bad to the point where shortly after they traded him away for a guy that played on the Flames' third and fourth line and was not very effective. Uh, so, like, it, you know, and that's why the Doug Gilmore trade is synonymous as, like, one of the worst trades in NHL history. But you're starting to see some chatter of like, oh, well, Huberto's just Lehman 2.0, and like that's not a good thing to have, you know, attached to your client either. So, you know, it, the boat is correctable, but you have to get the boat moving <laughs> in order to, you know, turn it to get it to go where it needs to go instead of down that profile, and, you know, it, it's not a good situation if, you know, Huberto's not being engaged properly. You know, I think this, I mean, I think that the Alan Walsh tweet was a bit of a black eye for the Flames, but I also think you and I have talked in the past about how Daryl Sutter has done a good job of taking heat for the team. When the team hasn't done well, he's kind of gone out there and as they'd say in wrestling terms, no sold it. You know, he hasn't seemed angry with his team. He's sort of taken that on his back. I'm wondering if the Alan Walsh thing is the same. I wonder if Alan Walsh has seen some of the comparisons like you're saying to Lehman and things like that and thought, I need to divert the attention and sort of let's post this tweet to draw the attention of me and away from 
what's going on with the Flames right now. Almost a, a sleight of hand piece. Yeah, and plus, you know, like when your team is being talked of in by the national media as basically being a laughing stock and like what the heck is wrong with this team and should they fire the coaching staff or 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 and 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 it, it's one of those where you know the players have pride in their own abilities as well and you know like getting slapped in the face like that by basically everybody this whole week it, it's a wake up call like you know you actually have to do the things in order to win the games and if you haven't been doing the things that you need to do uh why don't you get on that and you know it it motivation is always the key and if you can find you know like that's why daryl's always been famous for finding stories to put in the locker room to piss players off and you know it like hearkening back to 2004 like it, he basically had the whiteboard covered in news stories about how the red wings were going to annihilate the flames in the second round and that like you shouldn't even bother showing up to the rink because the games are already decided basically and you know the flames rallied around that and gave it to the red wings instead and you know like this team needs to find that thing to channel their all their frustrations at instead of just simmering in this nothingness that they have been this year and you know if the walsh thing is the catalyst to get the f fire lit under them great and we'll see uh, you know the one game results hey they they beat one of the best teams in the nhl that was riding a seven game winning streak you know that's very impressive go do that again you know go kick the flyers butt go kick the coyotes who have been really good of late you know then go beat vegas you know get on a roll and if you can translate this into a three four or five six game winning streak then you know like once you get past the toronto and minnesota games at the beginning of march like the schedule the rest of the way is basically middling to bad teams so you know you can really get on a protracted run it's just you know this was i think the right boot at the right time that the team needed and you know Let's go to that idea of, you know, Daryl Sutter not being fun to play for or whatever. I think one of the knocks of the Calgary Flames was they had too many player-friendly coaches before Daryl. And yeah, he might not be the funnest guy to play with, but, you know, and we hear this all the time, that these guys may be having fun. And I guess I would shoot back, the rest of us when we go to work every day don't always have fun, right? We're, we're not going to work and having a jolly good time every second of every day. Yeah, you don't want it to be a bad work environment, but I think there's a difference between having fun and, you know, maybe not having fun, but it not being a bad work environment. I think, you know, you need a, a coach that someone's going to be hard on your team and a coach that holds you accountable. And I, I don't think every day needs to be fun for these guys. No, and realistically, you look at Daryl and his teams always do well. Like when he was the coach of the Red or the Sharks. You know, they went to the conference finals. They they did well. Went to Calgary. They went to the Stanley Cup finals, won a division title. Then, you know, uh, won a couple of cups with the LA Kings. Last year, the Flames had their second best season they've ever had. You know, like, he continually has his teams in a successful position because the fundamentals of how he structures the game is the right way that this team needs to play in order to say win the stanley cup you know and be successful in the playoffs and you know like if they're not generating as much offense as they need to be well because they're playing a tight or shut down defensive way okay that's fine you have to find your own way of getting there yourself as well in the system to generate that offense and you know figure it out and rise above and you know like this team like when they are asserting themselves like you see them pop off for seven eight goals here and there and or like the rangers game where they only scored three but if the goalie wasn't being in god mode it would have been eight uh, you know and it, it's one of those where 
if the flames can figure themselves out where they can do all of the things that they need to, like this team, like if they're playing as well defensively as they are, they're getting goaltending that's NHL quality and they're finding ways to translate that into the offense. Like the flames all of a sudden are the most dangerous team in the Western conference by a long shot. And it it's one of those where it's, that's, part of the reason why everything's been so frustrating for this team because if they can figure out the formula everything's golden and have fun (laughs) but it you know and with this whole incident hopefully that's the catalyst that the team needed to find their way to getting to that next gear that they need to in order to move forward and I guess I would say too, you know, if they want things to be fun, they have to earn that. Yeah. You know, and, and and I mean that would be my thing is if you want it to be fun at work, earn it. Start winning, you're gonna have fun. Yeah. But you can't be, you know, underperforming, expect to go to work every day and have a jolly good time. Like that's not the way things work here. You've got to earn that. No, and you've seen True Living say, like, you know, last year the team showed that they were good enough. So he went out and got to Foley and Yarncroc, and the Flames played well, and they won a series. And you know, if not for imploding against Edmonton, they would have made it to the conference finals. And you know, it's one of those situations where, like this team, if they were playing better and had more themselves together, you know, would they have gone out and got a, a guy like Tarasenko? Probably. You know, or Ryan O'Reilly or, you know, whatever, whomever your iteration, Patrick Kane, whatever. You know, the Flames definitely would have gone out and got that player. But, you know, uh, we haven't seen that quite yet. And, you know, like this next week, that's why this week is so important. Like if you're starting to see consistency Like, if how they played against the Rangers with, like, Huberto and Markstrom asserting themselves, if you see that tomorrow, you see that against Arizona, and, like, you start getting on a roll, there is still plenty of time for True Living to go and get that reinforcement, whether it's a guy like Patrick Kane or whomever. You know, I'm not specifically saying him, it's just that's the name that I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, and you can go get that guy, and plug him into the lineup wherever you deem fit you know you can still do that there's still time to do that but like the team needs to show well and as we talked about last week you also need to balance yes there's time to do that but how much would we want to mortgage our future whatever that is picks prospects whatever what you know is what's gonna have to go to the door for a year that maybe it's not worth mortgaging yeah and that's where It'll be interesting to see what um, this team does in, over the next week, and you know, um, you know, our show next week about the trade deadline will be interesting on you know, evalu- yeah, you know, because we'll have more of those answers heading into that trade deadline. It it's just you know, I I think that like whomever they get is not going to be necessarily a rental player if they do go that route sort of like to fully where he had multiple years left but you know it, it, we'll see i i just we'll talk about that more yeah, next exact, week we, it, we, we 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 had that debate last yeah, week let's it, not have it again yeah this week. exactly and so matt with with all this talk we've we've talked about with alan walsh and the team kind of needing to move in that direction it's got me wondering does this team need a captain? Like, do they need to nominate clear leadership? And I think last year, yeah, they were number one for, you know, a good portion of the season, but they didn't have leadership. And while we heard this whole, you know, you and I said Daryl Sutter was the captain and all that, I think really they were lacking leadership. And I think that was seen on the ice, especially during the playoffs. This year, I think they're lacking leadership. Is it time this late in the year to put a C on somebody? Yeah, and... uh, how do you say last year because of the off ice things i think that like the flames kind of knew the writing was on the wall with both kachuk and gaudreau um not necessarily that that was going to be the end result but you know you know one way or another that you know certain things might be coming down the pike and um 
it, it was one of those where, like, last year, because of the ambiguity of the end result, that you didn't know what this team was going to be this season. So it made entire sense to run Daryl as the captain. And because of how, you know, up in the air this team has been, um, it's made sense to this point um, to have Daryl as the de facto captain because of the fact that the team there's so many new people etc cetera, etc cetera, that you know it didn't make sense right away like oh huberdo who's not been here is now the captain it's like um that doesn't make sense you know you know what i mean um but i think that now that we're getting in the back half of the season i think that the team needs to um say that yeah michael backland is the captain and that's what I was going to ask next is who would you name that captain? Who would you put as your, um, as your captain? And you think Backlund's the he guy? He's the only guy on my list. Why is that? Um, he has both walked the walk and talked the talk. He is the best player on the team right now. Um, he's one of the best players in the NHL this year. And, um, he just has the the never say die attitude that you need and you know he does all the little things right and he is one of those guys that you know everybody should be looking up to to see how he's doing it on the ice and like what you need to do in order to be an effective NHLer and then on top of it you know he's a really good person on top of it and you know, like he's one of, has been consistently one of my favorite people that have ever played for the Flames, who also happens to be really dynamite. So yeah, uh, in my mind, there's only one answer, and that's Michael Backlund. I think that's totally fair. I think having Michael Backlund as your captain, that's where I was going to go. Not where I would have gone at the beginning of the season, as you know. I was pushing for Milan Lucic at the beginning of the season, but I think now, yeah, you're right. Michael Backlund's the guy. He's also a guy who's going to probably have at least unless they make wholesale changes at least a couple more years here. So you're not going to, you know, put on him and then swap it again next yeah. year. Honestly, you know, and this is my own opinion, Michael Backlund is a player that I would absolutely love to see retire our flame and play his entire career here. Like I, I would not, not ever want to see him playing for somebody else. And that's fair. You know, um, just because he just embodies all of the right way of playing that, you know, it, it, he just does everything that you need Michael Backlund to do. And, you know, there are very few people that are that good in the NHL at what they do. And, like, he's a top 10 player for what he does. And he has consistently been a top 10 player for what he does. And, you know, like, to replace him in any way, shape, or form, like, it, you know, like, say he plays until he's 40, like, replacing him at the end of his career is going to be a hardship for this team because he has continually been that good, so. Yeah, that's, I think that's definitely a fair statement. Um, and maybe it's time. I mean, maybe you need to put, and I think that's been part of the thing, too, is there's really been nobody, and I hate to say this, but nobody to sort of take the brunt of the... You know, when the team's been bad, you generally parade your captain out there. Or when the team's good, you parade your captain out there for either the success or the failure. There's been nobody to be that public face of this team. No, and, uh, you know, as much as, um, you know, like the team uh, was up and down when Mark Giordano was the captain, um, you know, it made sense that uh, he was the captain you know, during his tenure. And, you know, now this team, uh, it, th frankly, it's gotten to the point where they need to have a captain. And they do. You know, and, you know, Backlund is the guy that has shown the most. And, and I think that, like, the team needed to have somebody step into the role. Uh, not just be, you know, like Mark here now after Ginlow was traded was kind of the de facto. Yeah. That guy, he that guy, made, the next man yeah, up. that guy makes sense. And, you know, like with the ambiguity of everything over the last two seasons, you need it to sort itself out. And I think that we've gotten to the point where that, that is the case. I would agree. 
Well, Matt, I think we're pretty much done Flames topics this week. The last thing we want to do is give congratulations to the Lindholm family. Um, Elias Lindholm was out for the New York Rangers game, obviously. he His wife was giving birth to uh, a child, and they've had their baby boy. So congratulations to the Lindholm family for their new arrival. Yeah. And, you know, like I know how much they've had difficulties through COVID and, you know, miscarriages and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm very grateful that the things were able to finally work out for them and you know that they have a healthy baby boy because you know the heartache of everything that they've had to go through over the last few years has been daunting and you know i'm just grateful that things finally have worked out for them well let's see if things will work out for the flames this week uh last week sadly i was right with my predictions predicting uh loss to ottawa and detroit a win to the rangers so i'm up four to two in the predictions game right now um, we will see if maybe the Flames' luck can change. They have four games this week, one at home, and that's tomorrow against Philadelphia Flyers at 2 p.m. matinee start time for Family Day. Then the Flames go on the road for the rest of the week. On Wednesday, they are in Arizona to play in front of 5,000 or less fans um, at the at the arena there. I forgot what they what – they, oh, the Mullet Arena um, in Arizona. Then the next night in Vegas, the 7 p.m. start time. And then in Colorado on Saturday, Hockey Night in Canada for an 8 p.m. start time. So, Matt, we've got four games in the docket. What are you thinking for this week? Um, I'm going to be a little bizarre and say four wins. I think this is the catalyst that drives the Flames finally into that lengthy winning streak. Wow. Okay, so you think that you think they're going to just take this and ride the week? Yeah, I think that... With everything that's happened, like, how would you say, if they waffle again and say are two and two or bad beyond that, um, then you can kind of write the team off uh, for this season because this week was embarrassing for the team. Yep. And, and they responded effectively in the Rangers game. If you don't take that ball and run with it, that says that, yeah, there is no solution in the room. So what do you think? you got to get three wins this week in order to... to yeah, pretty much. Week? Yeah, pretty much. And then much. after that, there's only two games for the deadline after this week. So if you don't do it now, you're running out of time. Yeah. Actually, there's only one game because uh, the Toronto game... Oh, that's right. The, yeah, the night after of. the deadline. Yeah. Um. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to split the week. I think that the Flames are going to win against Philadelphia. They did really well in that 11 a.m. or whatever that was game against Buffalo. And I think, like you said, they're going to ride high on that one. Just because they tend to crap the bed against bad teams, I'm going to assume that they're going to lose to Arizona. I think they're going to lose to Vegas. I think Vegas is going to overpower them because Vegas is a good team this year, and I think they'll beat the Colorado Avalanche. So I'm going win against Philly, win against Colorado, lose the two middle games. Uh. Where do you play Vladar this week? I don't. You put Markstrom in, even as bad as he's been, you keep him running? Yep. All four. You know, he played really well against the Rangers. Say, okay, bud, go for it. The, the net's yours. And, you know, don't worry about having to come out. You know, go do your thing. Because, frankly, you know, th this team needs him to be good and it you know he did play really well against the rangers if he's going to take that next step and recapture what he's been he needs to play and not worry about losing the net and i think that he just needs to ha have the, the ball and run with it and you know for better or phil and you know if he can channel that confidence that he had in the Rangers game moving forward. There's not going to be a problem for this team. We just need to see it more than not. <laughs> for me, I think you play Vladar in the Philly game because, like you said, he played well against the Rangers. And I think at this point, like you were saying, the Flames really needed this week to be a good week. And I really don't care who's getting you that week, which of the goalies it is. You play Vladar until he falters. So if he plays the Philly game and he looks like crap, I think, um, or sorry, you play Markstrom until he falters. I think you play Markstrom in the Philly game. If he looks like crap, then you put Vladar in, in the Arizona game. If Vladar looks good, then you play him again in Vegas. Like I think you've got to, I think right now each goalie's got to keep earning their starts. Yeah, I agree. 
And that that's also part of the reason why I think that, you know, Markstrom will play all four is just because I think that the Flames are going to go on a run. Let's hope so. you're right, Matt. Certainly need it. <laughs> well, that wraps things up for this week, and we'll talk to you next week as we uh, will be less than a week from the trade deadline at that point. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.